Okay, I'm just going to get something queued up over here. While I do that, talk to the person next to you and discuss the cheesiest thing you've ever seen on Facebook. The cheesiest. All the internet generally have been on Facebook. The cheesiest, like, like makes you cringe, you know, like, oh, really? That kind of thing. Or the worst kind of people on Facebook are the people that post what what kind of thing really annoys you on social media. Jesus could see your Facebook, would you be okay with that? <laughs> <laughs> and underneath it says something like, would you add Jesus as a friend? Would you want Jesus to see your profile page? And I thought, that has to be the stupidest thing I've seen on Facebook in a long time. If you believe in Jesus, you know that Jesus is all-knowing, all-powerful. They didn't have computers in the Bible, that's true. Jesus can see your Facebook page. <laughs> like, it's, it, Jesus... He can already see it, right? That, that's, you haven't thought that through. That to me is like worse than those people who put like a picture of a word search and says, I bet you can't find the word horse. And horse is the only picture. So it's the only word like right in the middle. And it's in bold letters. Only 2% of people can see the word horse. It's the only word in it. It's so obvious. It really annoys me. Anyway, this got me thinking. This got me thinking about a little bit about Facebook and social media. And it made me think that actually, okay, yeah, Jesus can see my Facebook, blah, blah, blah. He can already see my Facebook. But it got me thinking, how much do people know about us, really? When you look up someone on Facebook, I had to meet this girl, I was asked to go meet this girl, so I didn't know what she looked like, so I thought I might not be able to actually recognise her. I'll look her up on Facebook, and sure enough, there she was. And there was lots of stuff about her, her profile was very open, so I could see an awful lot of stuff about her life and what she was like. So I thought I had a fairly good picture of who I was going to meet. When I met her in person, she was completely different. It was genuinely, definitely her, but the person I actually met in person was a totally different person. Because actually our Facebook and our kind of social media and internet presence is very carefully managed, isn't it? We very carefully manage that picture we're going to put up. Oh, don't put that one. I've got terrible hair in that. Don't put that one. That's an awful picture of me. No, I can't have that on there. 
that's better. Yeah, I think, let me just check with my internal, personal, uh, like marketing department in my brain. Yeah, we can do that, that's fine. It's like we've all got our own personal brand, haven't we, that we produce. This is our public me. I don't actually look as fabulous as I do in real life. <laughs> no, it's the other way around. I look fabulous in Facebook photos and terrible in real life. That's actually the reality of it. So we sift through these photos and these statuses quite carefully, don't we? I know that I do. I think we all do, actually, if we're really quite honest. Except for my friend Sharon, who makes a real point of putting the ugliest, worst pictures of her up just because she hates this kind of behaviour, and I fully respect that. <laughs> she looks genuinely awful in all of them. <laughs> but she's trying to, so that makes it cool. So, anyway, can you imagine what it would be like, though, if someone were to actually see all of you? Like, all of you. If someone were to, to actually know everything about you, if somebody could know every conversation you've ever had, what? <laughs> everything you've ever eaten, not just the photos of food you put on Facebook, every thought that you've had, every little thought that you've had, that's terrifying, isn't it? <laughs> every email, every Facebook message, every everything all of your internet history, through all of time, on every device that's ever existed. That person would know every part of you, wouldn't they? Would they still want to know you? <laughs> Is the question. But not the brand of you. This leads me to the Incredible Hulk. And this may not make any sense, but it will. So we're just going to watch um, a clip from, we're going to watch the trailer to the Incredible Hulk, and apparently the best version of the Incredible Hulk, according to the geek that I married. So, okay. Sweet. I've got my eyes on my aspects of my personality that I can't control. It's your trick. That's Phil Dunphy. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Bruce, trust me when I tell you I've heard them all. Not this one.
That's a good job there isn't a She-Hulk. Apparently there is a She-Hulk, isn't there? There is. There is, according to the geek, but that would be inappropriate, because she would just be wearing green shorts. It would be awkward, I mean purple shorts. Anyway, the fact is, I think that actually all of us have a bit of a Hulk side. There's a side of us that we want to be, and then there's the there's side of us that actually, that we don't like. And the side of us that we're trying to not be. The side of us that turns away from God sometimes and gets a bit self-destructive. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes I think we make a clear choice. We're not going to go this way, we're going to go our own way. I'm going to be the Hulk for a while, and I don't really care what anybody thinks. I'm going to do that thing. I've just decided. That's what I'm going to do. And sometimes we kind of slide into our hawk side and somebody points it out like, you're ugly and green right now. Oh yeah, I didn't realise I was doing that, sorry. We're going to read a little bit from the Bible now. Because the Bible talks about the hawk side in terms of darkness and light. And can you see the screen if I front with this here? Yeah, okay. Alright, so can you put my PowerPoint up, George? This is from 1 John. John was a great friend of Jesus. He's the John that, that wrote the book of John and the book of 1 John. He was Jesus' best friend. He talks about himself as the one that Jesus loved. That's a bit, you know, I don't know. It sounds a bit of a funny thing to say. I'm the one that Jesus loved. Everybody else can, you know, shove it. But <laughs> he seems to think he's Jesus' favourite. Anyway, they were obviously great friends. And he was with Jesus through everything, and he was a very important guy in Jesus' life, and Jesus was very important in his life. So, this is John speaking after Jesus has died and risen again. So he says this, this is the message that we've heard from him, him being Jesus, and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. So, God does now have a Hulk side, that's the first thing we can know from that. God is all about light, and never about dark. If we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we don't live by the truth. So if we say that we have a relationship with God, but we also think we're perfect, and that we don't have a Hulk side, then we're lying, then we're not telling the truth. So the Bible acknowledges here that we have a Hulk side, that we have some darkness in us. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So in order to walk in the light like he does, we have to accept that Jesus did something on the cross to deal with our Hulk side. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So there's no point pretending that we don't have a Hulk side, right? You with me? Yeah? Because by denying that, we're even lying to ourselves. So we're kind of lost in that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us, forgive our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. So there's a way out of this. There's a way out of our hog side. And I missed one out there. Can you see that? See that? There you go. I'll read number 10. If we claim that we've not sinned, we've made him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, he said, listen guys, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Just as we that again. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of of the whole world. So that is a game changer. That is mind-blowingly huge. That he can atone for the sins of the whole world. He can deal with the Hulk side for the whole world. That's massive and amazing. And this is the key to the whole thing. So we all have a Hulk side. We can go around pretending that it's fine and that we can handle it. We can be somebody else on a Sunday and hope that God doesn't notice. Me and God are fine. It's all fine, everything's fine. The best thing is just to try and be who I'm expected to be when I'm in front of the people that I'm supposed to do that with. And when I'm in his presence, he won't notice. <laughs> he won't notice that there's a Hulk me that he's dealing with. But the thing about the Hulk is he's bright green and 10 feet tall. So God can see it anyway. 
Because God is the one, that scary person in the beginning, that knows everything about us, that's seen everything about us, that was there for every conversation, that is there for every Facebook status, that is there for every email. God is there. He knows. He already knows. He sees our whole side. He sees everything that we've ever done. He's the only one who knows all of our thoughts and all of our desires. He knows all of our internet history. And he loves us anyway. That's the massive news. That's the thing about this passage, that actually he already knows about everything. He knows it all. And he loves us anyway. And he wants to make it right with us. I can tell you all kinds of things about my Hulk side. Some of you have seen my Hulk side, no doubt. We've all seen things in each other. I've made some terrible, terrible decisions. I've made bad choices, stupid things, things I really regret. I've said and done things I really regret in life. And we all have a list like this. I've walked away from all of this before. I've been the Hulk for several years at a time. That's the truth. Because what often happens if we completely ignore our Hulk side is that we're the Hulk all the time. And that takes over the side that we want to be. The side that God wants us to be. And that's what sin does. We're talking here about sin when we talk about the Hulk side. When we bury it and we ignore it, it kind of takes us over. But you see, God is our dad. He's our dad. The Bible talks all the way through it talks a lot about God being our dad. And dads always want the best for their kids. Most dads, good dads, want the best for their kids. And he always gives us a way back. I'm going to tell you a really simple story about me and my dad. If you've met my dad, I love my dad. He's great. He's a really great dad. I have a wonderful example of God through my dad. And I'm really thankful for that. One summer when I was about eight, my family invited another family around for a barbecue. And the other family brought with them this massive bowl of strawberries. I mean, they were perfect strawberries, like juicy. It was kind of like the middle of June. You know when strawberries, you pick them fresh. They're just, oh, they're perfect. They're better than any sweet you could ever have when you're a kid in England. And as kids always do, when they see something they really want, they ask for it. Please give me the strawberries. We want them now. It's the best thing we said in a whiny voice like that. And my dad said, actually, guys, the strawberries are for pudding. We're going to save them. And we're going to share them with our guests, okay? Mm, so, okay. But there were five of us. There was my, my older and younger brother, and then there were two friends that came from the other family. And we decided we would play a little game. It wouldn't do anybody harm if we just snuck a few strawberries. So, we thought we'd sneak some strawberries from the bowl, and we'd distract the grown-ups, you know, make it a bit of a game. You distract them, I'll sneak a strawberry, let's see how many we can get, kind of thing. We'd all take it turns to do it. It was great fun, we loved it. This is what kids do, isn't it? My older brother was a master at deception. He was really good at this. And he taught us loads of great ways to do it, like older brothers do. And he actually didn't take that many strawberries. He just spent the time making us do it. That's such an older brother thing to do. This was kind of like the mild Hulk, me, developing as a child, the sneaky one, you know, sneaking around. And it probably would have been totally fine if we stopped at a few strawberries. It, they probably would have you'd been, oh, that was funny, kids, all right, you know, that's enough now, ha ha. But they didn't notice at all. They were really engrossed in conversation. And then they moved to another part of the garden, which was like, oh, they made it way too easy. Like, we, you're not even looking anymore. So we ate them all, every single strawberry. We went and took, and we just stuffed our faces. We were covered in it. I mean, we ate all the strawberries. We had quite a tummy ache. And then one by one, we all sort of realized that actually there aren't any strawberries, and we're going to have to say why at some point. So inevitably, dinner ends. It's time for the strawberries. The question is asked of us all, like, what happened to the strawberries? And we had a little discussion previously, like, what could we say? Well, we could just say, like, a cat took them, or, like, a homeless man came past, and he was so hungry. You should be proud of us, really, because we fed that man. Like, <laughs> but actually, none of us could think of a good reason, so we all just sort of stood there, covered in strawberry juice, and said, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like kids do. We weren't very creative. We have no idea what happened to the strawberries. It's dripping down our faces, but we have no idea. So as you can imagine, my parents were pretty annoyed at this. And um, it was the only pudding that was on offer, so they were quite embarrassed. And after a while of being told, told off, or kind of told to own up, my dad took me aside, took all of us aside, 
and said this. He said, look guys, I know that you ate the strawberries. I know. I actually know all about the strawberries. But what hurts me is that you won't tell me the truth. If you tell me the truth, I won't be cross. There'll be consequences, but I won't be cross. And we can move on and I'll forgive you. And one by one, in our sort of tear-stained, strawberry-stained faces, we all admitted it and said, yeah, we did it. And we're really sorry. And we confessed. It was like the biggest thing in the world. <laughs> and we had to do the washing up as a consequence. That was it. That was our consequence, which felt terrible at the time, but actually isn't that bad. And my dad was fine and he forgave us and that was it. I mean, he never spoke of it again. I asked him about it recently and he said, oh, I didn't really remember that. You know, that's great about, about my dad. He hasn't got a very good memory. So, <laughs> <laughs> but my dad knew all along that we ate all the strawberries. He knew, didn't he? He knew 100% before we confessed anything that we'd done it. There was really no hiding it because he knew. We were covered in strawberry juice. How stupid could we be? But he said, I know what you've done, but if you tell me I make things right, it's going to be okay. And the first thing I want to say about my dad, and I said it, is that he's a great example to me of, of a little bit of what God is like. That God is a really, really good dad. He's a really good dad. I don't know what your dad is like, but God is a great dad. And the second thing is this, God actually likes you, loves you. He knows all of that stuff about you and loves you. And my dad offered us a way out of trouble because he loves us and that is what God is doing. We don't have to live in a state of constant guilt in God's presence because he loves us. He's not sitting there waiting for us to screw up again. He's not trying to catch us out. He's not that kind of dad. He wants us to deal with stuff and move on so that we can be free of it. That's his father heart towards us. So we can be free. So he knows everything about you. And he knows that we'll mess up time and time again. He knows we ate all the strawberries. He knows about our whole side. He knows that sometimes we get lost. And following God is not about being perfect. It's not about being perfect. The first bit of our Bible chunk said that God doesn't have a hope side. He's constantly good, we're constantly not good. We get it wrong, because we're human and we mess up. But following God is about being yourself with Him. It's about being the real you with Him. He doesn't actually want the Sunday you. He wants the real you. He wants all of you. You don't have to be the Sunday you, you can be the you that you are. I can't remember the first time I read this bit of the Bible that I'm going to read you now, the bit that we heard at the beginning, that song. But it never ceases to grab my attention and every time I hear it, it reminds me that I can and must be completely myself with God. So I'm going to read it to you again. It's Psalm 139 and it says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my laying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, you know it completely. Oh Lord, you hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go into the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light will become night around me, even the darkness is not dark to you, the light will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in a secret place. 
when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. He really, really knows you. And I mean really knows you. You can be yourself with him. And that's what a relationship is all about, isn't it? It's about saying, I can be myself with you. I love you, and also, I screwed up today. That's what a relationship is about. It's about coming to him and saying, this is who I really am, this is where I'm really at, this is the real me, good and bad. And I know that you'll forgive me. And God can deal with our sin. And sin is a funny thing. Sin is a bit like strawberry jam. This is my strawberry jam. It is. Would you open that for me? Probably. You can do it because it makes them feel <laughs> it makes them feel strong. <laughs> Sin is a bit like strawberry jam. We got jam all over our house. Because you know what happens when you get jam on your hands? If you get jam on your hands like this, it's really, really sticky and it's really messy. And that, this is what sin is a bit like. If we don't deal with it, if we don't sort it out, if we don't fix it with God. Because then what we do is we go around with this jam on our hands and we sort of pick stuff up and so it gets just, oh, it just gets everywhere and we put that down and that gets stuck on that bit and then it goes on the music stand and then it goes everywhere and then I'm like, hey, Brad, hey, how you doing, you all right? It gets everywhere and then it messes him up as well and oh, it just goes everywhere. That's a bit what sin is like. Unless we deal with it, unless God deals with it, he's the only one who can fix it. He's the only one. Like baby wipes. <laughs> Don't know what I do without baby wipes, am I? But God can deal with our sin, whatever it's like, however messy it is, however much jam there is, God can deal with it and make it clean again, make it new. And he never ever, he never says, actually guys, you went too far this time. You know what? That's too far. That's too far. I can't fix that. He's not like that. He's not that kind of dad who won't give up on you. See, I think, if you don't know Jesus here tonight, I think you came here for a reason. Jesus knows all about you. He knows everything about you. And if you don't know Jesus today, then find something out about him. Find out about him. Find out about the one who knows everything about you already. You don't have to do that side of the relationship. He knows you. Come and talk to him. Talk to us. Talk to somebody. If you do know Jesus tonight, and there's some jam going on in your life, if there's something that gets in the way, because sin gets in the way of us and God, it sits between us. He doesn't stop loving us, but he wants us to deal with it. He wants us to fix it, sort it out. He does. We want to give you some space to just talk to God and to give him your whole side. So here I am. This is the real me. Thank you for loving me anyway. I want to say sorry for this stuff. Give it to you. Because I want to be in the right place with you. And it's not often that we get opportunities to do that. Church is often about saying thank you and saying please. Sometimes we need to say sorry. Sometimes we need to actually say, you know what? I've been a Hulk for ages now. And I don't know the real me anymore. 